My name is Baiju Pulerikal and this is my teammate Jeff Riddle. We both uh, work for the uh, Cisco Advanced Services Organization and our uh, department is mainly focused on providing consultancy services to the cable service providers in United States as well as uh, the overseas customers. And um, the today's topic uh, for discussion is video over doxes uh, and I'm assuming some of you are already um, familiar with the DOCSIS technology, right? Uh, which is used for um, providing HSD and VoIP access over a cable network. So how many of you are already familiar with the DOCSIS technology at some level? That's good. However, uh, for the sake of people who are uh, new to DOCSIS, we will go through some high-level uh, coverage of the DOCSIS technology as well before getting into the details of video over DOCSIS. Uh, we do have a list of acronyms and uh, abbreviations listed here related to um, the DOCSIS and video over DOCSIS, which we are going to cover. However, I'm not going to go over the list this, is, this would be available for your future reference if you are going through the archived material. Here is the high-level agenda uh, for the session. Um, we would start uh, with a high-level introduction to the VDOC technology, followed by uh, looking at the um, business drivers behind uh, pursuing this particular technology. And um, we will get on to uh, the, some of the aspects of DOCSIS, especially DOCSIS Trio, uh, um, aspects which are relevant to the VDOC support in a DOCSIS network. And PCMM is, again, um, another technology related to ca cable broadband, which we'll, we will cover because uh, PCMM is um, going to be used as one of the mechanisms to provide quality of service for uh, video over DOCSIS. And video over DOCSIS uh, today uh, have got uh, two different architectures. One is called the CMTS bypass architecture, and the second one is the CMTS direct architecture. And we would be uh, covering both, but, but the CMTS direct architecture would be the one which will go into the detail. And uh, we will look at um, the aspects of scaling the application in a DOCSIS network as far as VDOC is concerned. And also, uh, we will touch upon uh, the telepresence of a DOCSIS, an enhanced ver version of the um, video telephony, and how we can implement uh, that by using the VDOC technology. Getting into the technology introduction, VDOC stands for Video Over DOCSIS, and um, as some of you are already familiar, there is a non-profit consortium of uh, cable service providers and the vendors who uh, come up with the cable products, the head-end products, as well as the customer premises equipments called Cable Labs. Uh, cab uh, the main objective of Cable Labs is to come up with um, the standardization efforts as far as the access technology side is concerned. Uh, today we do, we do know that um, a typical service providers such as Comcast or Time Warner offers uh, over-the-cable infrastructure not only the um, TV channels and other video applications like video on demand, but they offer high-speed internet access and uh, in most of the places, even voice over IP over cable as well. And the DOCSIS and the associated technologies are uh, uh, developed to address the standardization efforts and also um, to make sure that um, there are options available for the service providers to come up with new service offering as um, a method for um, additional revenue generation. And these new services, as they get developed, are standardized so that um, multi-vendor operability, interoperability is assured. And as far as video over DOCSIS uh, is concerned, I mentioned that DOCSIS is the access technology in use in a cable access network to provide high-speed internet access and voice over IP. However, even though we have um, 
uh, video services offered by our um, MSOs, uh, the cable service providers, those video channels are today carried outside the DOCSIS infrastructure. Um, they are carried as MPEG streams over um, dedicated uh, QAM channels in the downstream direction. And the objective of video over DOCSIS is to converge the video services aspect also into a DOCSIS infrastructure so that you can provide triple play services by using the same DOCSIS infrastructure. And the advantage is going to be when you use IPTV, instead of streaming the MPEG for digital video directly into the cable, it gives you the option to receive those IPTV channels not only by using the traditional TV, however, it can be received by uh, personal computers and other uh, customer premises devices as well. And uh, the key uh, objective in going with video over DOCSIS is providing the quality of service for the video applications. Uh, as, as I mentioned, um, when you integrate the video services, the IPTV also over a DOCSIS infrastructure, then you will have to come up with some QoS mechanism so that when the providers start offering the uh, video services over cable infrastructure using DOCSIS, then there is some um, service differentiation available based upon the type of service you pay for. And we do know that today, um, there are a lot of internet uh, multimedia streaming applications in place. We call it over-the-top video because the way it works is even though those video streams like when you access YouTube or uh, watch any video clips from the internet, even though those um, video streams are carried over the DOCSIS network, however, there are no mechanism available to, today to provide the quality of service. So the uh, VDOC uh, technology covers the QoS aspect, aspects of the um, IPTV services over the cable infrastructure. Uh, actually, we are going to have um, a Q&A session to, uh, towards the end. Uh, hopefully, we will have enough time for that. However, if you come up with any questions as we keep talking, please interrupt us and uh, We'll try to answer that. And as far as the VDOC is concerned, it covers three aspects. Uh, video on demand, obviously. Um, and the broadcast video represents actually the standard TV channels which will be streamed as IPTV. Even though it says broadcast video, the multicast streaming would be used for sending those broadcast video in a VDOC network. And um, video telephony is another application which we can implement using the VDOC architecture. And like I said earlier, it provides QoS for video streams and it is a method for um, the service providers to provide managed video services over a single infrastructure. And as some of you know, video over demand is unicast and with VDOC implementation also it is going to stay the same and the broadcast video or IPTV would be multicast. Now getting on to the key technology drivers, I mentioned earlier that um, the DOCSIS standardization efforts from the cable labs have been uh, towards um, coming up with a um, standard set of specifications which can be used by these service providers as well as the vendors in developing the new products and implementing the services. And DOCSIS itself has got different versions. Um, it uh, initially started with DOCSIS 1.0, which was focused mainly on high-speed data. Then we have had DOCSIS 1.1. In DOCSIS 1.1, the main um, advantage was the enhancements made in 1.1 over 1.0 version was the enhanced quality of service, um, especially to support applications like uh, voice over IP over cable. And uh, the latest version of the DOCSIS, what we have today, today is DOCSIS 3.0, and there are several enhancements made in DOCSIS 3.0 version uh, compared to previous versions of the DOCSIS. And um, the key uh, improvements are um, 
the provision to um, support um, much higher bandwidth in the downstream and upstream direction. When we talk about a DOCSIS access network, it is not a simple, straightforward, bidirectional network, right? Because it uses the RF channels. So there are separate set of RF channels used for streaming traffic into the downstream direction towards the cable modem at home and for uh, sending traffic in the upstream direction using separate set of channels. And um, in order to increase the available speed for these downstream and upstream channels, DOCSIS has introduced something called a channel bonding, the concept of channel bonding. And with the introduction of channel bonding, uh, the operators can today offer services as high as 100 Mbps bidirectional for a particular subscriber, as opposed to 10 or 15 make what you see today. So what it brings in, when you have the option to provide 100 meg service, obviously it gives you the room to start offering additional services. If the provider wants to incorporate the IPTV also over the same infrastructure, then the available additional bandwidth can be used to uh, start offering the streaming of uh, the IPTV services and video on demand services over the same infrastructure. And um, again, uh, when you integrate um, IPTV also on the DOCSIS infrastructure, then you end up having a single infrastructure for carrying voice, high-speed data, as well as video, thereby um, eventually resulting in CAPEX and OPEX uh, reductions on the service, pro service provider side. Any questions so far on the technology drivers? Now, let's start looking at um, the DOCSIS um, technology at a high level. DOCSIS stands for Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification. Like I mentioned earlier briefly, it is a set of standards um, introduced by um, the cable labs uh, in order to um, make sure that um, there is vendor interoperability when uh, the vendors come up with different products which support the DOCSIS infrastructure for HSD and voice and other services. This uh, diagram shows a very high level overview of how a DOCSIS based uh, network looks like. What you have here is um, on the service provider side, you do have an aggregation device which is the CMTS, uh, or Cable Modem Termination System. And CMTS is the uh, uh, system on which uh, the individual subscriber premises side cable modems would get terminated to. And the um, media between the cable modem at the customer premises side and the CMTS is called something called a hybrid fiber coaxial network. The reason being, uh, we do know that um, from the CMTS, um, the uh, file layer transmission media is used out of channels, right? However, um, uh, the actual planned in implementation for a cable network uh, typically uses uh, the uh, fiber as well. And uh, what happens is for long hauls, um, at the head end side, we call the um, Service providers uh, facility where the CMTS resides typically as a head end. And at the head end side, you have the CMTS and the outputs uh, coming out in the downstream direction are out of channels in the uh, physical media and the upstream also is received in the out of channel as out of signal. However, in between, in order to support um, uh, long haul networks, uh, they introduce something called a, f a hybrid fiber coaxial network. Um, this E slash O and O slash C, what you see is electrical to optical conversion and the optical to electrical conversion. So eventually when it uh, gets closer to the uh, home, it is converted back to electrical over the cable and uh, received by the cable modem. And obviously, you need to have uh, servers, OS servers in the back end to support the provisioning and other aspects of um, the uh, cable modem support uh, to let them start uh, using the services.
as you can see the cmts is one of the key components in a doxis network which is the aggregation device to which all the individual subscriber cable modems get terminated and there are two types of cmts uh, today and um, this is especially defined uh, with um, DOCSIS 3.0 uh, along with the DOCSIS 3.0 architecture. Uh, the DOCSIS 3.0 can be implemented by using something called an integrated CMTS where all the logical functions which a CMTS needs to be performed uh, will be uh, will reside in a single, uh, single entity. And then we do have something called uh, modular CMTS as well. Uh, and in the case of integrated CMTS, um, we do know that um, for the access network, you need to handle the physical layer aspects of transmission as well as the link layer aspects of the transmission, right? Logical link layer aspects or media access control layer. This physical layer and the logical link layer for uh, DOCSIS MAC and DOCSIS uh, downstream phi and upstream phi are defined in the DOCSIS spec. And on top of that, then you have the layer three at, uh, traffic, right? The IP and upper layers. And the uh, function of a CMTS is to handle the DOCSIS MAC layer, which is the data link layer for DOCSIS processing, and the PHY layer for downstream and upstream. And if you have the layer 2 as well as the layer 1 components residing in the same CMTS, then it is called an integrated CMTS. And as you know, the CMTS is the aggregation device which interconnects the um, wide area network side uh, of the service provider. And also on the right side, as you can see, it is interfacing with the um, typical cable plant. This block diagram shows the modular CMTS architecture. What has been done here is we have seen that in the previous slide, um, all the different logical entities for a CMTS was residing in a single system. Now with the modular CMTS architecture, as you can see, the layer two processing for DOCSIS still resides in the MCMTS core. And so is the upstream physical layer components. However, for the downstream physical layer components for streaming, right, the file layer uh, streams in the downstream direction, it has been taken out into an external entity called an HQAM. And these HQAMs actually have been there uh, in the um, cable service provider networks for quite some time. They used to be traditionally used for streaming video, the MPEG video, into the cable plan. And with the introduction of DOCSIS 3, or the same EQAM can support today DOCSIS traffic as well as the, um, the video streams. And when you take out the file layer aspects of the downstream, you do know that there should be some timing control entity available to make sure that there is a timing synchronization established between different components of MCMTS. DOCSIS timing server is the, the entity which provides centralized timing information to the MCMTS core as well as the HCOM and other um, relevant components which form part of an MCMTS or modular CMTS logical architecture. And the reason why the DOCSIS timing server is required is, as some of you know, the timing is extremely important in the case of a DOCSIS network because um, in the upstream direction, uh, it uses um, a combination of um, TDMA and uh, FDMA technology and you have the option to have multiple CMs trying to transmit at the same, direct, same time in the upstream direction. And there should be strict timing relationship established at the time of initialization of a cable modem so that the, um, every time a cable modem wants to transmit in the upstream direction, so it is in sync and it is transmitting at any allocated time which has been provided by the CMTS. And when it is ICMTS, because of the fact that the downstream phi, upstream phi, and log data link layer resides in the same box, you do not need an extra external timing entity to take care of it, because the centralized timing of the single system can handle that. However, with the MCMTS, we have to have an external timing server.
And these are some of the components which we have already seen in the previous slide. The edge comp, um, which I already covered, um, not only can uh, take care of the DOCSIS traffic, but it was traditionally carrying the uh, MPEG video streams also, what we get today as the TV channels at homes. And MCMTS core is the one which handles the data link layer functions for uh, the DOCSIS network as well as the upstream five. And moving forward, it is even possible to decouple the upstream five uh, physical layer aspects also from the MCMTS core and have it reside in an external entity to support modular um, uh, implementation. Edge resource manager, um, is not quite relevant with our discussions today. However, just to touch upon that, what it does is um, when you are using external uh, resources from an e for um, uh, downstream transmission, uh, you have two options to uh, associate the corresponding logic, um, the MAC layer um, from the MCMTS core uh, for the specific downstream channel to the e -com. You can either do it statically or you have a mechanism where if you have something called an edge resource manager, the edge resource manager can be used to, to uh, be the centralized authority to assign the COM resources so that the COM resources will be more efficiently used based upon the different CMTSs requirement. Uh, the, uh, if a CMTS, for example, uh, wants to have additional bandwidth available for a particular application, then it can ask for an additional channel from the COM. And the way it accomplishes that is by using the Edge Resource Manager. Getting on to the details of the DOCSIS 3O, the latest uh, set of specifications um, released, um, I believe it came out uh, somewhere around uh, 2006 time frame, and a um, lot of major MSOs are in the process of deploying it, and at least there are some limited deployments available out there. And the main motivation behind coming with DOCSIS 3O was um, to increase the available channel capacity, like I mentioned earlier, by going something called a, the concept of bonding the channels, you can uh, provide uh, much higher throughput uh, to the um, customer premises equipments. And there are several aspects of security which um, is um, uh, added into um, the DOCSIS 3 to provide enhanced security on the access network. And um, IPv6 is another, another support which is introduced with DOCSIS 3O. Prior to DOCSIS 3O, IPv6 was not supported by cable access networks, but a cable access network which is implemented using DOCSIS 3O supports IPv6 too. And as you know, um, uh, MSOs are today facing the address depletion at various levels, and um, it really helps them in going with expandability of addressing with IPv6. And uh, it allows the deployment of new service offerings because what we are trying to accomplish with DOCSIS 3O is by, um, you know, um, giving the option to have additional channel bandwidth, right, by going with something called channel bonding. And with that additional uh, higher bandwidth, we would be able to offer new, uh, new services. Say, for example, the video over DOCSIS, which we are going to cover more, more detail later on. Now let's start looking at uh, the concept of channel bonding, uh, in particular the downstream channel bonding. The objective is to provide faster speeds uh, to the access network. Um, this slide actually talks about why DOCSIS 3O is ideal for um, the video over DOCSIS. Like I mentioned earlier, channel bonding provides uh, higher, ba fatter pipes in the downstream direction so that it gives you the option to start offering additional services, room for carrying traffic corresponding to additional services, and multicast enhancements. When it comes to IPTV uh, and other video applications, a uh, lot of the um, applications are carried in multicast, and there are a lot of enhancements done in the DOCSIS 3.0 to um, facilitate that. And IPv6, um, when you move toward the concept of um, 
assigning um, uh, IP addresses to different uh, CP devices at the, uh, uh, for a residential customer or a business customer. Obviously, the um, scalability of the addressing comes into picture, and IPv6 definitely addresses that. And end of day, um, you end up getting a converged network which uh, does uh, carry not only vo uh, high speed data and voice, but the video services also over the same infrastructure. Now, getting into the details of downstream channel bonding, the concept is very straightforward. Uh, prior to DOCSIS 3.0, we have had in the downstream direction a single channel. The cable modems will always lock onto a single downstream channel. And that single downstream channel always had the bandwidth limitations, depending upon what kind of R of parameters you have configured, 64COM or 256COM or whatever it is. The maximum it was receiving uh, for US DOCSIS was around um, 37, 38 Mbps available effective rate. And with the channel bonding, what we are doing is we are taking multiple physical RF channels and combining them to form a single logical bonding group. And obviously, the overall available bandwidth for the bonded channel is much higher. It depends upon how many physical RF channels you have taken and combined together to form a bonded channel, right? So you, say, for example, if you take four... Um, RF channels to form a bonding group, then the available throughput for the um, bonding group is four times more than a single channel can provide. And with the channel bonding concept, the cable modems are not tuning into a single downstream. It is tuning into multiple physical RF channels, and for a, phys a specific traffic flow, it can receive the packets corresponding to the traffic flow, flow across all the channels of the bonding group, thereby giving it, you know, much fatter, fatter logical pipe. This is a pictorial representation of how the channel bonding works. And I think it is good to just mention uh, something called the concept of service flow in the DOCSIS world. A service flow is nothing but an entity um, which has been provided with a set of QoS parameters, such as uh, the maximum downstream rate or upstream rate offered, um, then uh, whether what is the level of priority, if, if there is a minimum reserve rate, what would be the minimum reserve rate and things like that. And the significance of the service flow is uh, the service flow will be used to carry traffic in the access network. We have downstream service flows for traffic towards the cable modem and upstream service flows for traffic towards the CMTS. And what traffic uses the service flow will be decided by the set of classifiers, one or more packet classifiers you associated with the service flow. And prior to DOCSIS 3.0, always a service flow was linked to a single channel. But with downstream channel bonding and upstream channel bonding, a service flow can be linked to a bonding group. What that means is the packets corresponding to a service flow, you can send via a bonding group. And when you do that, obviously comes the question of packet resequencing, right? Because you, instead of a single channel, you are planning to send the packets corresponding to a flow across multiple channels. Then obviously at the receiving side, the packets will have to be resequenced to make sure that out of order uh, delivery, potential out of order delivery has been taken care of. So in order to take care of this resequencing, if a service flow is using a bonding group, uh, the service flow typically would be uh, um, provided with con uh, something called a downstream service identifier and a resequencing index. So at the receiving side, it can use the downstream service identifier as the resequencing index. And then the packet, the, there is a packet sequence number also um, provided in the DOCSIS header. The DOCSIS extended header so that at the receiving side, it can make use of the DC to identify a specific flow and use the packet sequence number field to reorder the packets before sending it to the customer premises side. And that is what uh, this pictorial representation is explaining. Here, as you can see, there are uh, three downstream physical channels, D1, D2, and D3, forming a bonding group. 
and packets P1, P2, and P3 were part of a single service flow. And um, so what CMTS did was distributed that across the individual channels of the bonding group. And uh, when this on the CM side, the cable modem, after receiving it, has did the re, uh, done the resequencing and sent the packets out to the customer premises side. And let's take a look at how the channel bonding can uh, create um, higher efficiency gains. So this is um, done by using the uh, high definition and standard definition IPTV channels uh, as, an, uh, as an example. Uh, let's assume that we are using four separate QAM channels, right, not in bonded board individually to carry standard definition and high definition channels. Then, in this example, we can um, accommodate a total of 10 standard definition channels and five high dimension, uh, definition streams. And uh, each, in, uh, each channel has got some additional bandwidth left out, but because of the fact that they are not in bonding mode, those leftover bandwidth is not enough to accommodate another HD channel. However, if you are going with a four channel bonding group, because of the fact that for the same flow, you can slice it and send across multiple channels forming the bonding group. Here, in addition to the 10 standard definition and high definition streams, you get room for two additional HD, HD streams as well. So the bottom line is, if it is unbounded, it can always create inefficient boundaries, but with the bonding, uh, the efficiency of the packing is obviously improved, like any other um, uh, the bonding concept. And this is an example which shows where a single downstream bonding group is used for a per service area. And what you see here is, um, Service group represents the set of all the channels available to a specific serving area. Uh, if there are n number of modems which is part of a serving area, like a neighborhood, then every single modem has got the visibility of all the channels which form part of the service group. Not necessarily every single modem needs to be tuned into those channels. And what you see here is we do have a bonding group one created, which is uh, created to uh, provide services to the service group one, right, with a set of modems connected to it. And however, this bonding group is a hybrid bonding group which carries high-speed data, voice over IP, and IPTV. So there is no uh, uh, separate bonding group available. So um, all different types of services, the triple play services, are offered by a single bonding group. And likewise, if the, there are going to be multiple service areas, and in service group N, which is serving a different service area, you have a bonding group N, again, carrying high-speed data, voice over IP, and IPTV. And some more com, uh, com points uh, as far as the DOCSIS to your channel bonding is concerned. Um, as far as the cable modems themselves are concerned, they are not quite aware of the number of bonding groups, say for example, out of a set of channels available to them. All what the CMT is going to instruct the cable modem is to be providing them with a set of, or the set of channels which they have to be tuned into. The set of channels on which they are tuning into might be part of multiple bonding groups. Say for example, one bonding group might be carrying um, only HSD traffic and another one might be carrying um, IP video traffic. But the cable modem doesn't have to know which bonding group has got, uh, which are the channels corresponding to those bonding groups because um, when the cable modem has been instructed to tune into those channels, of different bonding groups, uh, the cable modem has been provided with the downstream service identifier for the flows and linked with the corresponding channels too, so that it can use the downstream service identifier and the packet sequence number to resequence the packets, whatever it receives. And again, if you have like n number of channels in a service group, doesn't mean that every single modem 
in that service area is going to end up using all the end channels. It could be like business subscribers might be using a separate bonding group compared to uh, the residential subscribers from the same set of end channels. Two subsets used to, to create different bonding groups and um, in order for uh, providing the service differentiation. If there are multiple bonding groups um, available into a specific serving area, how the CMTS decides um, which bonding group is um, going to um, be assigned to uh, which modem and which service flow. This can be done by uh, doing something called service flow attribute. Uh, I talked about the service flows earlier, right? How a service flow get associated to a bonding group can be controlled by defining something called a service flow attribute. And when you have a service flow attribute defined for a service flow, and then that service flow will only use the bonding group um, for which um, the same attribute has been defined. And there are a uh, little more uh, detail into it, how exactly it does it. Like uh, you can prevent a service law from using a set of bonding groups, but allow to use it a, another set of bonding groups or other way around. And here is an example where you have a dedicated bonding group available to stream IPTV channels and um, another bonding group which is carrying high-speed data and voice. Again, the cable modems, if you look at the cable modems, they are tuned into all the individual channels, and they don't have to be concerned about uh, which set of channels from which bonding group, because they can, as long as they have been instructed to tune into those channels, and they have been provided with the DSEED and the associated channels for the DSEED, they should be able to receive and process the information accordingly. Now, getting on to multicast enhancements, um, any questions so far? Let's take a uh, quick look at um, some of the multicast features introduced in DOCSIS 3, or especially those are relevant to the video over DOCSIS support. Source-specific multicast, especially with the support of IGMP v3, is a feature introduced with DOCSIS 3.0 and um, IPv6 multicast support. MLD version 1 and version 2 has been defined uh, in DOCSIS 3.0. And in addition to that, the multicast QoS uh, has been standardized. How to provide QoS for the multicast streams um, in the cable access network. It is part of the spec now. And you can do some kind of multicast authorization as well, uh, which is defined in the spec. And the multicast encryption is another uh, thing which has been standardized because um, vendors like Cisco and other th uh, third party uh, vendors were using some level of multicast encryption, but it wasn't standardized, and today it is standardized in DOCSIS 3.0. And uh, the key benefit, benefit of going with DOCSIS 3.0 multicast architecture is um, the cable modems have become more protocol um, agnostic because CM doesn't have to snoop the IGMP packets anymore or MLD because the uh, multicast join and all the multicast signaling happens directly between the CPEs behind the CM and the CMTS. This is accomplished through the DOCSIS 3.0 multicast support. What happens is we already mentioned about the downstream service ID, right? Every single multicast flow is associated with the downstream service ID. And uh, it doesn't matter whether the multicast flow is using a single channel or a bonding group. If it is in DOCSIS 3 or multicast mode, every single modem would be using a, a downstream uh, channel ID. And that downstream channel ID, uh, I mean, down Downstream service ID, downstream service ID can be used to, to um, tune into specific multicast groups which um, the cable modem will need to pass on to the CPE side. So the DCD is used instead of using the GMAC or the group MAC address. In a pure DOCSIS 3.0 implementation, if the CMTS finds out from an IGMP join which is received from the CPE side that this particular CM will have to receive this particular multicast stream 
and forward it to the CPE side, what it will do is it can do something like dynamic bonding change and provide the set of channels on which that multicast stream is available and also the DC, the downstream service identifier corresponding to the multicast stream so that the cable modem can tune in and collect that multicast stream based upon the DC and pass it on to the CPE side where the, you have the IP setup box or wa whichever wants to listen to that multicast stream. And this is called the GMAC promiscuous operation because it doesn't have to look at the group MAC address but it is using the DC to filter the right multicast streams as far as the cable modem is concerned. Uh, however, the DOCSIS 3 gives the provision for the GMAC explicit filtering also for some of the hybrid modems which doesn't fully support 3O. If the DC filtering is implemented in software, for example, GMAC explicit would be the way to go. And this is just a picture a representation of how it works. Um, when you have multi multiple multicast streams, but some modems, uh, some CPEs would like to listen to one or the other. As you can see here, the DC1 and DC2 represents two downstream channels which has been combined to, a, combined to form a bonding group. And there are two multicast groups here. Uh, both are source specific, S1, G1, and S2, G1. And those are represented on the access side by downstream service identifiers DC1 and DC2. As you can see, the, uh, the CPE behind the first CM1 is interested in the first multicast stream. So he just needs to tune in and uh, collect the flows coming in by using uh, the downstream service identifier DC1. And the second CM is tuned in to only the downstream service identifier DC2. Even though both streams are available in the bonding group, the CM doesn't have to receive and pass it on to the CPE side. Now, we, uh, we will take a high-level look at the PCMM technology or packet cable multimedia, um, which is um, the reason why we are covering it also is uh, this would be one of the QoS options which we will be using for video over DOCSIS technology. And the key thing to highlight as far as the packet cable multimedia is concerned is it is something called signaling agnostic because the end devices doesn't have to be QoS aware. The end client devices and end application devices doesn't have to be QoS aware. And it kind of decouples the applications from the QoS framework. The PCMM QoS framework can be used to provide QoS in the DOCSIS access network, not only for voice, but for any multimedia applications or any applications which you can, like, uh, the um, video games or um, uh, interactive um, uh, interactive video or um, uh, a video over telephony or whatever kind of multimedia applications, you can use the same um, framework, QoS framework to support it, which is decoupled from the actual application specifics as well. And that's the main advantage of packet cable multimedia. And what you see here is um, some of the kinds of application listed which could make use of uh, the packet cable multimedia. The framework can support soft phones. It can uh, support residential standalone MTAs. What that means is when you have a multimedia terminal adapter right behind a cable modem, to support voice, it's a standalone MTA. And then it supports the gaming consoles and business IADs and whatnot. And here what we see is a PCMM high-level architecture. Um, these are some of the components of uh, PCMM. And what we see is at the client side, uh, the client is not quite aware of, in this scenario, uh, the QoS um, signaling aspects. All what the client is doing is it is contacting an application server um, which is doing the application-specific signaling for the client. And the application server in turn contacts an application manager. 
Application servers not necessarily need to be part of the cable provider's network. It can be an external service um, uh, application service, or it could be part of the K MSO network too. And there is an interface defined between application server and application manager using SOAP XML, which uh, the application server will use to provide these um, service request to the application manager. When the application manager receives the service request, the application manager is the entity which is going to do the um, uh, authentication and authorization of the client. And if the authentication and authorization of the client succeeds, if it is an ex application, say for example, video streaming, what application manager is going to do is, it will send a policy request to the policy server. And the policy server is the actual entity in the network which implements the policy and decides whether the QoS can be enabled or not for the specific application request. And when the application manager contacts the policy server, it can um, either provide all the details of the QoS requirement for that particular application, including the maximum rate it is requesting, any kind of RAM, uh, minimum resort ga rate guarantees and things like that. Or it could just specify that, OK, this is like a uh, voice uh, types of, of application or video application. And based upon that, the policy server would be able to uh, come up with the right set of QoS parameters. Policy server not only does that, policy server does some kind of admission control check too. Policy server needs to make, make sure that um, for this client, where, whether he is allowed to have an additional QoS, he might have exceeded the allowed number of you know, uh, QoS uh, services supported. And if all the check is uh, successful, the policy server is going to contact the CMTS and push the policies using the COPS protocol so that the CMTS, if the resources are available in the access network, will implement the uh, uh, implement the corresponding QoS and does a dynamic signaling mechanism to create a dynamic service flow for that particular application so that between the cable modem and the CMTS, the um, client's application traffic will be using that uh, dynamic service flow created which has been provided with the QoS which was signaled by the policy server. And as you can see, the record keeping server here is mainly for the billing purposes. And there are three different client types available with PCMM. Only the client type one is relevant because that is what is supported to today. Client type one means it is not aware of any QoS signaling and it doesn't do any explicit QoS signaling. Like I explained in the previous uh, slide, it is done by um, the interaction of the application manager and the policy server. And the CMTS is the one which initiates the QoS signaling and makes sure that the, the QoS is established and the corresponding service flow is in place with the right QoS for the applica application. Application server uh, takes care of the aspects of the application signaling control itself. Then we have the application manager. The client may contact the application server or it could potentially contact the application manager directly. and. Um, how the client contacts the application manager directly, the signaling aspects are not defined in PCMM. Likewise, if the client is contacting the application server, the signaling aspects are outside the scope because what kind of signaling it is going to use depend upon what um, application it is going to be. If it is some SIP telephony application, it would be using SIP signaling. If it is, uh, it has to use some HTTP to get some content, then it will be using HTTP. So it is entirely outside the spec. Policy server, I think we already covered the aspects um, uh, taken care of by the policy server. It um, does the admission control mechanism, make sure that the client is authorized to make use of the QoS requested, and he hasn't exceeded already by requesting QoS in the, in the past, which is already active, and also locating the right CMTS where the client is located so that it can push the policy down using the uh, COPS. So the policy server is the policy, the decision point and the CMTS is the policy enforcement point. And like I said, the CMTS typically gets pushed with the policy corresponding to a particular application, and then it will do the signaling on the access network side to um, initiate, initiate, a, initiate a dynamic service flow with the relevant QoS.
this is a particular signaling flow and uh, I don't think I have to go through the, um, all the details of this um, uh, signaling aspects discussed here because we covered already some of it during the previous slides. Basically what it is showing is the client um, contacting the application um, manager first and then it triggering the uh, signaling from the application manager to the policy server and then eventually to the CMTS and on the uh, access network side, the um, uh, the uh, dynamic service log getting ex established through the access network signaling, and it's the same uh, when uh, when it is time to uh, delete a flow and release the resources. Um, any questions before I hand it over to Jeff to get into the details of um, VDoc, VDoc architecture? Thank you, Baiju. Um, so now that you've been exposed to the technologies involved in providing VDoc, uh, I'm going to kind of go into how it all fits together. Uh, so there's basically two uh, general architectures for providing uh, video over DOCS services. Uh, one is the CMTS bypass architecture, one is the CMTS direct architecture. I'm just going to talk a little bit about bypass. Uh, most of the time it's going to be focused on the direct architecture. So the CMTS bypass, uh, also commonly referred to as DBA or the DOCSIS IPTV bypass architecture, um, works by actually having the video downstream carriers uh, carrying the DOCSIS con video, video over DOCSIS content uh, under a separate administrative control than what's used for the other services such as high-speed data and voice. Uh, the way this works is separate uh, downstreams uh, qualms are provided for video versus the other services. And the advantage of doing this is then um, all those video IPDV channels aren't, aren't having to go traverse through your whole CMTS network so you don't need the extra WAN side capacity on, this, on the CMTS side. Uh, but there, the drawbacks, of course, are that now you've got you know, two, different domain, two, two different administrative domains uh, controlling video versus the rest of your services. And uh, those the resources associated for video can, then can't be shared for other services, so you don't have the ability to, if they're not being used, to use those for uh, like uh, data transfers and other things. So here's a, a, a picture of, of what I was just talking about. So what you see up top here is the is the DOCSIS 3.0 implementation with a modular CMTS for providing uh, the services talked about bef before, and on the right hand side here we see two modems. Uh, one modem being an HSD only customer and the bottom modem being somebody who's you know, got a PC for HSD services and also an IP set top box for, for video content. And as you can see, the video channels are on these separate frequencies here, the bypass channels one through N, uh, which are going to the modem. And then these other three uh, downstream carriers are what's being used for HSD and other services. And so there's this, so what's going to happen, uh, move on a little bit, is this, the set top box is going to you know, signal that he wants to watch a particular uh, video stream, and that reaches this entity called the Bypass SRM ERM, which is a session resource manager slash edge resource manager. And uh, that guy is then going to contact uh, the DOCSIS framer in the edge qualm in order to set up the, that the edge qualm resources are available and to get everything uh, prepared for sending these streams. So what's going to come out of the Bypass box or, or, the, or, the, or the video uh, source is standard um, multicast, you know, IP packets, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to need to be converted into a DOCSIS frame to be, in order to be understood by the cable modem. So this is the process of the, of the resource manager setting all that up. And then once the media starts to flow, it, it comes through, uh, gets DOCSIS encapsulated, and hits the modem on those bypass channels. So as you can see, the whole CMTS core up top is not involved uh, at all other than the passing of the upstream signaling. So again, does this, so they, uh, there's you know, benefits and drawbacks to, to, to either approach. Um, you need the custom cable modems because there's two different entities controlling these cable modems. Uh, you need an edge qualm that can you know, take the MPEG in and do the DOCSIS framing. And, uh, and the, this edge qualm, though, does not have to be DOCSIS 3.0 capable, so there's no need to talk to a DTI server because it's not passing any DOCSIS uh, layer 2 MAC management messages. And again, the, the you know, you need this entity because the, the bypass SRM. And also, the again, the, the problem about 
that your services are now isolated, so you've gone away from doing the integrated model where you're having the triple play over the same uh, transport infrastructure. So with the direct architecture, you know, again, we talked, Baiju talked earlier about how DOCSIS 3.0 is great for video because it gives you the availability to uh, bond channels together and provide much higher, spe higher speeds. Uh, prior to that, a single downstream carrier, as you mentioned, was about 38 uh, megs per second of usable traffic, and modems today can support up to eight downstream, eight downstream channels, so you can see much higher speeds are now possible. So, and again, in, in a, compared to the other example, in the, in the direct solution, uh, again, the, the two, two customers over here, you can see now that the customer who is both a data and a IPTV subscriber is receiving all of its downstream carriers from the from the CMTS. So it's receiving four downstream carriers which can be carrying both both or either uh, video or data traffic. So in this case, you know, he, the, the customer uh, makes a request to watch particular video streams such as an IGMP packet hitting the CMTS core which is going to trigger the, the start of uh, the stream from the video source. It's going to go through the CMTS core, then get split, uh, you know, make efficient use of the bonding group channels across those four channels, and then ultimately reach the customer. Now, that was you know, using the same channels for all services. Uh, you could also you know, have separate channels for different services. So in this case, uh, it's still a four-channel modem using three channels for, for data and that fourth channel for, for IPTV. Or uh, so in the, in the signaling again, the same type of thing happens. Except for now, the video traffic is just going on that dedicated channel for for uh, IPTV. So you know, is data session or the data sessions of other customers on that same service group would not have been impacted by this video stream. So um, we talked about. Uh, Couple differences in terms of IPTV. You have uh, um, channels which are you know, like your, your your main tier of channels. Your high, you know, your NBCs, your ESPNs, which are going to be uh, most likely watched by some subset of customers all the time. Then you also have kind of like your your far off specialized channels where uh, concepts in in today's world, such as switch digital video, would be used to. To only send those send those channels down to the service group if there's active viewers. So, in the case of broadcast, um, if, you, if you're doing that broadcast model now over an IP infrastructure and a DOCSIS infrastructure, there's no need to, uh, or it doesn't make much sense to have that static broadcast television on QAM channels, on multiple QAM channels across that CMTS, as uh, you know, the, the content's always up and it's no different from one area to another. So this concept of RF spanning can be used to in order to get more efficient use of your downstream channels. And really it's just nothing more than, um, like on, on the RF side, uh, basically take a splitter to take in, uh, channels, those video channels in and then divide them out and send them to all the different service groups. So here's an example here where, you know, the, each service group has dedicated channels for their internet traffic. So you know, so the, the uh, amount of bandwidth available to the modems in service group one is not impacting modems in other service group. They all have four channels for browsing the web. But meanwhile, these video broadcast channels that everybody can see is getting split and then sent to these individual service groups. So instead of having to send these same four channels times N, uh, you only have to do it, you only have to send them up once. So again, you concept is that your, your uh, more popular content would be statically set up on these broad, on these uh, RF span channels, and then the more uh, specialized content would only be set up as, as needed uh, using a dynamic narrowcast model. So this, again, this is in a case where the multicast traffic would come in and it would go over those same, quant those same carriers that's carrying your HSD and other services. I think I love they talked about the, the items on this slide. So here's another illustration of, of, of the problem here. So this, in this case, all services are, are set across eight channels, and those eight channels then have to be dedicated eight channels for each service group. 
So if there's 35 service groups on the CMTS, 35 times 8 is 280 channels, downstream channels that need to be used in order to give uh, eight channel service to each service group. Now within the spanning case, those would then be split. And so you only need the f a dedicated four channels for HSD for each service group. So that's four times 30, uh, four times 35, and then the other four channels shared for the video service. So it's you know, almost a 50% saving in terms of how many downstream carriers are needed. Um, so part of the prob uh, uh, limitation there with, with having the, the dedicated channels for static, multi static multicast uh, or broadcast video is you're, you're confined by the amount of bandwidth supported in those four channels. So if you have four 38 meg channels, you know, that's roughly 150 megs that you can use for your video traffic. Well, with DOCSIS 3.0, you can actually do, do some things to kind of get around that as uh, you, the uh, IPTV customers are not going to be watching all streams at once. They're only going to be watching, you know, one channel at a time. So, so what you can do is actually use multiple more, more than four channels for that video traffic, and then that fourth channel, and have the modems using three channels for, you know, if it's a four-channel modem, have the modem using three channels for data, voice, narrowcast TV. Then that fourth channel dynamically changes that's tuned to based upon what video stream it's watching. So what happens is an IGMP packet comes into the CMTS. The CMTS figures out what QAM is carrying that particular multicast stream. Then it sends this, the DBC message, to, as you talked about earlier, to the, to the modem that tells it not only the DSID of that stream, but also what channel the modem needs to tune to in order to receive that stream. So it, it can change on the fly. And so you know, more than four, ch more, multiple channels can be used to carry that video content. Um, you're still under some constraints in terms of the, the amount, the, uh, the spectrum size that the modem can tune to at once but it definitely has its advantages. So some of the other ways you can scale the DOCSIS network for video is uh, one of them is, is stat muxing, uh, dynamic bandwidth sharing, admission control, and load balancing. Uh, I'll talk about each one of those a little bit. So if you have constant bit rate video, obviously uh, I'm sure you know it's not, it's not very efficient, but if you have variable bit rate video and you use stat muxing, then you can provide more content over over the same pipe. So basically, if a video stream is, doesn't have a lot of active movement in it, the amount of traffic it needs to send is going to be smaller. That if it's a like sports something like that, where there's a lot of movement going on, there's going to, the, the peak is there's going to be a burst of traffic, and by buffering the burst, the uh, the network can make more efficient use of the bandwidth and fit more streams into the same physical bandwidth or pipe. So the bigger the pipe. The better, the more efficiency gains you have, and then the, you know, since video is is not inter, uh, you know, IPTV is not interactive. You can uh, the jitter tolerance is a lot bigger than say for voice or or video conferencing or telepresence. So it's just more uh, graphical depiction of what I was just talking about. So again, another chart and type of thing where if you have uh, CBR streams, the number of streams you can fit on one QAM, two QAMs, four QAMs is a lot less than if you have variable bitrate streams. And also, you know, the, the bigger the pipe, the better efficiency you can, get, you can use of those streams because the odds of multiple video streams, you know, having rapid bursts at the same time is less. Dynamic bandwidth sharing is a way to share those QAM resources for different services. So if the, if we go, going back to that previous slide, so as you can see here, in, in this case, you know, these, these video streams are only consuming less than 100% of that available pipe. But what dynamic bandwidth sharing does, it allows you to use whatever's left over for other services, such as internet downloads, HSD type services. So you let the data, ser the data server sponge that excess bandwidth. Also, if the video traffic is in a lull or if it's, or if no, if it's a, it's not active at the time, then that bandwidth then can be used for data until it becomes needed for the video traffic.
as the, the CMTS can, will, you, know, you can assign priorities to certain services, and you can assign like static reservation levels and things like that, such that some services are guaranteed a certain amount of service, and if they're not needed, then that bandwidth can then be used for other services. And uh, you know, you can have you know, typical DOCSIS 3 on modems, either four-channel models or eight-channel models, and you can have a mixture of them in a service group, and you can have bonding groups of the channels. Uh, so if you send eight channels, you can have some modems bond to the, front, the first four, and some modems bond to the second four, and some modems bond to all eight. It's, you're pretty flexible in what you can deploy. Uh, with, with video screens, you know, you got, uh, in terms of, especially if you're sharing resources between applications, you need a mechanism for admission control. Um, so you want to limit the amount of bandwidth these flows can use or set priorities for who preempts who. So this is all functionality that's available on the CMTS. So in the case of the video stream coming in, this is a case where most likely you would not have dedicated streams for video because if it's dedicated, you don't need the admission control purposes. But in this case, you have an IP, maybe like some a narrowcast service. The IGMP join comes in from the set-top box. And the CMTS determines if that user is authorized to watch the stream or if that stream is, a, is one he wants to uh, allow to go through his network and what kind of QoS guarantees are there for, like if there's a CIR rate signed for it or, or what have you. Um, instead of using IGMP, a lot of operators uh, prefer uh, the more the PAC cable model since that's what they're using today for, for voice and, uh, and other applications. So in this case, instead of the set-top box talking IGMP directly with the CMTS, it contacts the packet cable multimedia application manager, which would trigger the, the chain of messaging. Whoops. So the COPS messaging to talk to the policy server, which in turn contacts the CMTS to set up, to set up the QoS for that particular multicast stream. So you can, so a, a gate, what's called a gate set message would come into the CMTS, which contain information like with the set-top box IP address and what kind of QoS it needs. And it would kind of function as both a way of setting up those uh, QoS parameters across the DOCSIS network and kind of like as an IGMP join at the same time. Uh, different from IPTV, you know, the case of video on demand, which is, you know, your unicast traffic. A couple of different ways you can provide emission control and QoS for that. Uh, one way is for the, vi the VOD streamer to simply send RSVP messaging. So RCP mass path message, you know, traverses through the network like any other type of RCP. But once it hits the CMTS, the CMTS would then auth use its uh, emission control mechanism to authorize that RCP message and at the same time convert that into DOCSIS messaging to set up QoS across the HFC network. And if that's successful, it would in turn generate RCP reservation messages back to the streamer. So then that video traffic could flow on the QoS-enabled path down to the set-top box. And just like in the IPTV case, uh, you may want to do this. You, you know, you may not be comfortable. The operator may not be comfortable opening up RSVP on their network, so they go to, to they prefer a PCMM model, where either the client or the streamer on behalf of the client could generate the packet cable multimedia request to the application manager, which is again just like before, generate the COPS messaging to the policy server and down to the CMTS to dynamically set up the QoS for that VOD stream. Any questions or comments on any of that? Uh, so the last thing we wanted to talk about here was, was telepresence. Um, it's been a big buzz lately. I'm sure most people are aware of it. So um, telepresence is a technology that allows you know, r remote parties to talk to each other as if they were physically in the same room. So it's, it's different from video conferencing, and it's a, a higher level of service. Um, you're talking about you know, 65-inch high-def screens, uh, so it's the person on the other end is life-size, uh, CD quality sound, you know, uh, a lot of thought goes into stuff like in terms of the painting of the rooms and lighting of the rooms, you know, professional microphones, all that, all that jazz. So it really feels like the, the person you're talking to on the other end is sitting right next to you. So this could be used for uh, the teleworker environment where, uh, you know, maybe you have, you have some parts of your company or your group working in distant locations and you need to have meetings or, or uh, you know, executive needs to, needs, needs to contact his, the rest of his branch from a remote location. 
Uh, could also use be for uh, distance learning type uh, applications. Or another pop another envisioned uh, scenario is the medical profession, where you have like you know doctors in a remote and uh, working together for medical purposes. So, so the question is: So this telepresence stuff. Since you're talking about high def video streams and high, you're, you're, the bandwidth consumption is relatively high, and it's not something previously accounted for in the in the cable world. But now with things like such as DOCSIS 3.0, now, now the ability to provide telepresence over a DOCSIS network is much more feasible. And there's two really key uh, key aspects of telepresence going on these days. Uh, one is the teleworker case, and this is the case where MSO is provide is only serving as the transport, and both the uh, telepresence unit as well as the call control are all in the enterprise, and it's totally outside of the MSO control. So this is typically uh, across some kind of secure tunnel, such as DMVPN or IPsec. The other model is the consumer model, where you know, kind of like residential telephony, he says he's now he's providing a, a a telepresence service. Uh, this could be like you know, in that me the medical situation I talked about earlier. In this case, the MSO may or may not have control of the uh, call signaling and, and applications. So there's a graphical description of this, and so here's a teleworker unit where his, uh, you know, his big 65-inch monitor screen here is sitting behind some kind of home router, and this home router can then, this gen has a, a DMVPN, which is an encrypted you know, dynamic multi-VPN tunnel to his enterprise. So all this traffic is encrypted, so there, there needs to be a mechanism to provide QoS for these telepresence calls, and one way to do it, it would be to have some kind of RSVP, PCMM implementation where this telepresence unit uh, initiates some RSVP request and this home gateway router would then dynamically uh, signal the PCMM messaging to set up QoS across this DOCSIS network. And the same thing could apply for a you know, smaller medium business office you know, who's reachable over a DOCSIS infrastructure. Then the other, the other uh, Aspect we're talking about before is the consumer model, where it's just somebody at home, and this, in this case, is probably you know not going to be over an encrypted tunnel. So the MSO could use some mechanism such as deep packet inspection. So once it identifies the telepresence traffic, it could trigger off the packet multimedia mechanisms to create QoS, or there could be some direct signaling between the uh, either the, the telepresence endpoint or uh, the switch used to switch these calls. Typically, telepresence is just acts very much like an IP phone. So it uses protocols such as SIP to talk to a, a soft switch, and that soft switch can then be equipped to enable the QoS for the telepresence call. So a summary of what we talked about. Uh, you know, we talked about providing video over DOCSIS services, so providing video content over the same DOCSIS network used for high-speed data, voice, and the other services today. Uh, the need to leverage uh, technologies such as DOCSIS 3.0 and Modular CMTS in order to provide these fatter pipes and the benefits of the multicast enhancements in, in the DOCSIS 3.0 specification. Um, you know, we talked about the pack cable multimedia and how that works to dynamically set up QoS so you're not tying up resources when video is not actively across the network, especially since the constraints of video are so high, you don't want to be tying up resources when there is no video being watched or streamed. And then the other thing we talked about was the telepresence for the interactive, you know, uh, communication between parties as if they're physically together, a high, kind of like a high-end extreme of, of video conferencing. Any questions? Yes? Uh-huh. Good question. So, so, so the question is on uh, terms of uh, what are the the uh, bandwidth requirements for telepresence calls? Uh, telepresence video you know, is 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 high definition. So you're talking 1080p, 720p. But what what they do is they typically have different uh, compression techniques techniques based on the anticipated amount of motion in the video content. And since uh, you know, a video conference call is typically you know two parties sitting at a desk talking to each other. It's not like you know 
each, each end playing basketball and, and trying to relay that way. So you can make some uh, reasonably safe uh, bandwidth savings by just by utilizing higher compression techniques. Uh, you know, H.264, the, the MPEG-4 standard is used. So in a, in a 720 call, that's, that's a, roughly a, an average rate of about uh, 1 meg, whereas if you're on a 1080 call, that's closer to 3 or 4. So depending on, the, on what kind of DOCSIS plants it's on, you may have to go to the, the, low, the lower codex. And also depending on the motion, because you know, it might be one, 1 meg average, but then we start adding all the overhead, like if you're encrypting the, encrypting the media, you might be moving it to like 1.4, 1.5, and then if there's a burst of motion, it might burst up to, temporarily burst up to 3 or 4 meg. Um, a legacy DOCSIS, pre-DOCSIS 3.0 upstream, uh, the highest modulation you could use is 16 qualm, and the channel width is the size of 3.2 megahertz. So doing that math, that's like a 10 meg pipe, but you know, usable amount of bandwidth is like 8 meg. So if you're trying to fit, have one user doing six meg of traffic in an eight meg pipe, you know, that's not going to be really realistic. So that's where the benefits of, of DOCSIS 3.0 come into place. Um, also, you know, once you, if you can enable your upstreams for DOCSIS 2.0, which allows uh, upstream channel to, to double in size to go up to 6.4 megahertz and modulation up to 64 qualm. So that's a raw bandwidth of about 30 meg, so maybe, you know, 24, 25 usable. So that's much more better to handle that traffic. But obviously if you had a, uh, a network or an upstream channel where multiple telepresence calls going on at the same time, you definitely could could hit capacity, and that's where we're having techniques to for admission control to accurately uh, reserve the right amount of bandwidth is needed, and, and also you know where traffic engineering comes comes into key play. Did that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Well, so. Uh, 3.0, you know, it doesn't change the physical layers, characteristics of the upstream, but it allows for bonding. On the upstream side, uh, most modems today typically support uh, four, up, four upstream bonding. So, you know, four times 24, 25. Uh, the, the problem with, whoops, with, uh, with the upstream is that you're, you're limited by the physical spectrum available for upstream. So it's, you know, 5 to 42 megahertz, so it's only a little after little over 30 megahertz wide. So if you have, you know, four, 6.4 channels, that's getting close to that limitation, so you really can't do any more. But that, I mean, that definitely does allow speeds of, you know, close to 100 meg in the upstream. Any other questions, comments? Well, I thank everybody for your time. I uh, hope it wasn't at least a little bit informative. <laughs> thank you.